Good afternoon to all our listeners today. My name's Andrew McColl. I'm the Queensland Director of Family Voice Australia. It's my pleasure to welcome Professor Jim Allen to our Zoom session today. Uh, Zoom, uh, sorry, Zoom. Jim has a chair at the University of Queensland. He's published widely in the areas of legal philosophy and constitutional law in the US, the UK, in Canada, and in Australia. He also has a sideline interest in bills of rights. He's opposed to them. And he's glad to have moved to a country like Australia with no National Bill of Rights. Professor Allen also writes widely for newspapers and weeklies, including The Australian, The Spectator, Australia and Quadrant. Good afternoon, Jim. Andrew, how are you? Thank you for having me today. That's a pleasure. Jim, straight to our questions today. Does our constitution in Australia protect freedom of speech? So I think what uh, the viewers need to know is that you can have a very successful setup without any written constitution. The oldest constitutional arrangement in the world is the British one, which is copied in New Zealand, sort of Israel, and they have no written constitutional text. So you just leave each generation to make laws as they see fit. It's, it's the most democratic setup. So Australia came along and we basically copied the written constitution of the US. We have the most American written constitution in the world. In other words, when you look at the bicameralism, we have a strong upper house. Hardly anybody has that. The US has that, Italy has that. Most democratic countries don't have that. And I grew up in Canada. The upper house in Canada at the national level is appointed. They do nothing. An appointed house does nothing, same in Britain. And the provincial legislatures are all like Queensland, they're unicameral. And so, we copied that. We copied American federalism. We copied the idea of having the capital city not in any state, you know, the same number of senators per state. What we didn't copy was the American Bill of Rights and the American amending formula. The latter just came up with the voice rent referendum because uh, unlike Canada and the US where it's the political class that decides if there'll be a constitutional amendment, in which case Australia probably would be a republic already and we definitely would have a voice, uh, we copied the Ameri the Swiss system where you ask the voters. So that's very un-American. And we opted not to have a Bill of Rights, which takes me back to your question. Um, we have a, our written constitution is structural. It's like a recipe book. It tells you about bicameralism. It tells you about federalism. But it's basically trying to mimic the British version of parliamentary sovereignty, where you leave all decisions to the voters as many as possible. And so the protection for free speech in this country is purely democratic. You have a certain trust in the voters and who they will elect. And so we don't have a, a Bill of Rights that has a free speech provision like the American First Amendment or the Canadian Entrenched Charter of Rights. Now, I think that's a good thing. A lot of people, I mean, most legal academics like Bills of Rights, but here's the problem. When you buy a Bill of Rights, all you are buying is the views of the judicial and lawyerly cast. Because when you think about it, a phrase like the right to free speech, everyone is in favor of that. It's so amorphously abstract, right? I used to debate bills of rights with George Williams. And I, I used to joke that everyone in the room puts his hand or her hand up for the right to free speech, even the guy in the brown shirt and a little mustache, because it's not answering any questions. But then when you say, well, do you think tobacco companies ought to be able to advertise outside primary schools, which the Canadian Supreme Court held that they could for about 15 years? Where do you want to draw the line on campaign finance rules? You know, how, what, do, what restrictions, if any, do you want to put on defamation laws? Nobody agrees about that. And so a right to free speech is, is, is um, articulated in such amorphous terms. It's so Olympian in its amorphousness that it doesn't do any of the work. It really just hands over the work to the judges and the judges start drawing the lines. And my view, and I think every conservative with a brain in his or her head is going to see that the lawyerly cast is not really going to draw lines that we we're going to get out of the politicians. Politicians are accountable. Now, you know, I'm a, I'm a Churchillian about democracy. It's the worst form of government, except for everything else. And that includes decision-making by the unelected judges. And so a Bill of Rights, it, you know, people all assume that the right to free speech is going to play out the way they want it to play out. Because, you know, again, 
No one believes that you ought to be able to say anything you want. No one believes you can counsel violence. Uh, no one believes that you ought to be able to publish child pornography or the list of CIA agents in Russia. And so the right sounds unconstricted, but it is constricted. And so who do you want drawing the lines is the only key question. The Australian Constitution has eight or nine times it says until Parliament otherwise provides. It's trying to leave all the big decisions to the elected parliament. And over the last hundred odd years, the judges have tried to take some of those back. We've had two constitutional referenda to try to bring in a bill of rights. They both lost. The last one was in 1988. Um, I like the fact that the voters want to leave this with the politicians. Now, it's true. You might get a government you don't like that tries to bring in a stupid bill like this misinformation one, but your remedies are political. And if you rely on the lawyerly cast, the judges, on the assumption that the judges are going to agree with you on all these line drawing uh, exercises, all I can tell you is you're you're divorced from re the empirical reality. Uh, so I I think the protection for free speech in this country is solely political, the same as it is in Britain, the same as it is in New Zealand, in Canada and the U.S. They've gone down the line of having an entrenched bill of rights where they leave these decisions to the to the judges, and I don't think the uh, results are, here. I'll give you an Australian example. The uh, judges in this country in 1992, four years after the failed referendum to have a Bill of Rights, they just made up, in my view, the implied freedom of political communication. Sounds great. I'm a big free speech guy. I think it's great. But, you know, it's only ever kicked in to strike down legislation about six or seven times. And every one, except the first time, every time since the first time, it's been Liberal Party legislation. So, again, if you think that the, you know, you could flip a coin seven times and what are the odds it's all going to come up heads? So yes, in the very first case, the ACTV case, that was labor legislation. But since then, whenever the judges have ever pulled the trigger and struck down legislation, it's been coalition legislation. And you have the added cost of every time an important issue gets to the high court, you have to pay the lawyers to argue it. And overwhelmingly, they uphold the legislation because it's obvious that this implied freedom is pretty, it sits on pretty shonky foundations. I think personally, the judges just made it up because they wanted to have a Bill of Rights. But if you think that in the deep in the structure and the sort of unseen fibers of our Constitution, there is this implied freedom. I don't. Again, I like the idea, but I don't. Um, then even then, it's pretty odd that uh, when they do pull the trigger, it's almost always coalition legislation. So that's my long-winded answer. We do protect free speech, but we do it through the democratic process. You could add in another way of protecting it, which would be to hand it over to the lawyerly cast from whom we pick judges. I think that's a terrible idea, but uh, most of my colleagues would would uh, revel in it. Okay, so is there something lacking in our present legal structure that suggests that a misinformation bill is actually needed? Well, it's not so much the legal structure. I think the problem is that uh, some people don't trust their fellow citizens and they think, uh, you know, they're too gullible, they're too, their capacities are too limited. And if they hear the siren song of somebody who's selling them a bill of goods, they'll succumb. Well, you know, that's probably true on occasion. I mean, Yale Law School bought uh, a lot of, uh, put a lot of their investments in with Bernie Madoff on the assumption that, uh, you know, they could get 10% returns every year. People are gullible. Uh, but the problem is, why would you think that the, the guardians, the, the gatekeepers are any better than the average voter? Who knows what's misinformation? And if we look at, and I, I'm still sort of fuming mad about uh, the lockdowns and COVID, because I was an early critic. I think I might have been one of the first, Ramesh Thakur and I. And so the, the, the problem is that when you look at the last two and a half years of the pandemic, you know, the Stanford epidemiologist, Professor Jai Bhattacharya, he has concluded that the biggest source of disinformation were governments. They got almost everything wrong. They got masks wrong. You know, the, the gold standard, and I never thought I'd read so much uh, epidemiological stuff as I did during the, uh, the COVID pandemic, because my first degree was in math and I was reading all these studies. But, you know, the gold standard for uh, the, these sort of studies is the Cochrane Review. And the Cochrane Review has concluded not too long ago that masks don't do anything. I still see people walking around with a mask. All through COVID, I saw people by themselves in cars with a mask. They, I don't know what theory of virology they're operating. People have been broken, and they've been broken to a large extent by the fear 
the deliberate attempt to scare people senseless by government. And so why would you think that the gatekeepers, the government officials, are going to be any better than you know individual human beings at making these calls? The one country on earth that uh, the one country in the OECD that sort of just gave people information and left them to make their own calls was Sweden. And that had a left of center government, by the way. And Sweden, it's patently clear from the data today that Sweden got it right. The one criterion you cannot game, it, well, you can game it, but it's the hardest one to game. You can fool around with start and end dates, but uh, cumulative excess deaths. You look at the regular number of deaths in the country and see how many more there were than you would expect. So what they let's say you take the period from 2015 to 2019, what's the average number of deaths a year? And then you look at the COVID years, right? You adjust for population growth. And so those are excess deaths. And you look at the cumulative excess deaths from the start of the pandemic to you know the end or till now, to now. Um, Sweden has the lowest in the OECD, the country that didn't lock down, the country that, you know, it closed some secondary schools for about a week, and that was it. Uh, they they didn't have any of these ridiculous sort of police thuggery and brutality and politicians picking which small businesses they would bankrupt and close. And they have the smallest number of COVID uh, excess deaths. So people forget it's not just COVID deaths, it's cancer deaths for people missing checks. In my view, and I said it from the start, the entire lockdown call was a, a fiasco. It's it's ruined poor kids' educations. It's wrong down the line. Now, what happened was um, a right of center government got locked into mimicking China, which is effectively what we do. They, they also got the lab leak theory wrong. They got whether the vaccine would stop spread and whether the vaccine would stop you from getting they got that wrong. Uh, there's a fair bit of evidence that vaccines... Uh, have a problem for heart, especially for young males. Again, all down the road, the stuff that the government and the experts were telling you turned out to be not all wrong, but large, a large chunks of it wrong. And yet these are the people who want to regulate what you can hear on the internet net through this <clears throat> bill. And, and again, if you look back to the Morrison government, it was Paul Fletcher, who was the minister of community. He was the one who first mooted one of these ridiculous misinformation bills, a supposedly right of center government with a commitment to freedom. They didn't want people to be talking about how they were handling COVID. And a lot of people online, you know, amateurs studied the data and they pointed out there were problems. And, you know, these epidemiologists, the government ones were getting things wrong. And as well as sort of lay people, some of the world's finest epidemiologists, Botticelli at Stanford, Gupta at Oxford, Kulldorff when he was still then at Harvard, they wrote the Great Barrington Declaration. You know, they were being censored. They were being attacked on campus. And, you know, the Great Barrington Declaration just advocated for a Swedish approach, almost all right. And so, the political class has a lot to apologize for. And so the idea that now they're going to come in and police what is uh, misinformation is ridiculous. Yes, it's true. People do peddle falsehoods online, but so do governments. And the problem is not so much the falsehoods. The problem is you can't just imagine that God is going to be the one policing this. The people who are policing this are every bit as likely to make errors as people who are just, uh, you know, posting stuff on the internet. And that's the problem. And so, you know, you either believe that the best way to get at truth is the old John Stuart Mill, uh, you know, the crucible or the cauldron of competing ideas will play out and you want to hear as many views as possible, or you believe that there's some superior beings who happen to be bureaucrats appointed by the executive government who have their fingers on the pulse of timely godly truths and they will be the ones who police this and if they don't do it themselves well what they'll do is they'll hand the call over to some fact checkers you know like the rmit lab who were calling everything disinformation during the voice debate and basically this is my area constitution almost everything they called uh, misinformation was actually true you know, the no campaign did not deal in misinformation or disinformation. And so you have to worry a lot about this sort of heavy handed authoritarian desire to limit what people can hear. Well, that's that's a very full answer. Thanks, Jim. Now, we know that um, 
the former National Secretary of the Shop Distributive and Allied Employees Association, Joe De Bruin, has been quoted recently as saying that the faceless bureaucrats of the ACMA are to be empowered to restrict free speech in accordance with their own judgments on social media platforms. These bureaucrats have no claim to infallibility as to what is true and what is not. Is Joe right? Well, he's probably being too kind. But uh, other than that, I'd say, well, look, to some extent, ACMA is not going to do it. They're going to, you know, pawn off the call to some sort of fact checking body. It would be like the ABC fact checkers or the RMI. We all know that these fact checkers to the, you know, whenever they air, they always air in one direction. You can almost never find, it's not like half the time they air for the sort of more pro-freedom conservative side and half the time they they air for the more left-wing collectivist side. All of the errors are in favor of the left. Now, there might be, somebody might somewhere, you know, maybe there's a transit of Venus coming up and somebody might find one example somewhere where they err on the other side, but virtually never do they err in the other way. So it's not just ACMA, they will, they will sort of insulate themselves by pretending to Hand, well, they won't. They will not pretend. They will actually hand the decision over to some. Like who? Who? Why would you think that people who append the label fact checker on their shirt are somehow uh, infallible or somehow have any better sense of this than anyone else? So the whole fact checking industry is highly dubious, and it's premised on this view that some groups of human beings, usually with a degree, you know, I, you know, intelligence is a dime a dozen, and some of the most gullible people are intelligent. And so, again, um, I think, uh, what was his name? Mr. DeBrin. You know, if yeah. anything, he was being too kind. Okay, so if the ACMA, ACMA gained the power to prosecute, wouldn't it be in the interest of rival digital platforms to make allegations about each other? Isn't that what defamation laws protect us from anyway? Yeah, well, the thing about defamation is the truth is defense, right? And uh, it's really hard to prove things sometimes, but the way they've set this up um, is that you were going to be in this position where they won't, they will say they're not going after individuals. They're going to set up this either a code of conduct or they'll let, they'll let there be a, a you know, a, either you'll either have an industry standard and if they don't like the industry standard ACMA, then they can impose a code of conduct of sorts. And then, uh, you know, they won't say they're going after Jim Allen. What they'll say is that Jim Allen posted something that was disinformation and they'll trot the social media company. And I think the fines go up to six point eight million dollars, five percent of turnover. You know, with those kind of massive fines, you know, nothing's going to happen to me. They just won't let me post anything online because the, the incentives, if this bill goes through, is for the social media companies to become incredibly risk averse. Because one error, and who knows what these these ACMA people are going to do to them, and so every incentive is going to be to be risk averse and just not let people post stuff. And then they'll say, well, you know, ACMA saying, well, we're not stopping people, but you know, the social media companies are. And this is all happening, by the way, when you know a, a, an important circuit court in the U.S. has found that the Biden administration was colluding with big tech during COVID. They were colluding to shut down information much of which, let me say this again, is was true. You know, they were they were pillaring people who said that the virus escaped from the lab. The Lancet, which is the you know state of the art peer reviewed journal, was not letting people publish that view. And and uh, you know, only later when we get access to all the emails and stuff do we know that, uh, as Matt Ridley said, I got misled by the fact of what they were allowing to be. Matt Ridley says now, great science writer, that this is the. Uh, overwhelmingly the likely truth. I mean, who would have guessed that a virus that emerged 20 yards away from a secret laboratory dealing with virus, secret viruses would be the place where the virus came from? I mean, come on. And if you even mentioned that at the time, you were deemed to be dealing in misinformation or you were a racist for thinking that, you know, it's all because they were Chinese. And so if you adopt this sort of holier than thou uh let's limit speech type views, it's a lot harder to get at what's actually going on. And it's really worrisome. This bill is a very, very dangerous bill. And what we really need, and I mean this seriously, even though it was the libs under Morrison and Fletcher who came up with this brain dead idea, labor's made it worse. 
we need a promise from Mr. Dutton that when he wins the next election, because I think the voice referendum puts him in a good position to win it. But when the liberals next come into power, their very first step, if this bill is enacted, the very first thing they will do is repeal it. And if it's blocked by the Senate, they will have a double dissolution election. We need a promise from the libs, not like their Section 18C, we're going to repeal hate speech, which, you know, they promised that. And the minute they're in office, they fold like a wet noodle. We need an unbreakable commitment, if this goes through, that they will repeal it, even if that means an immediate double dis dissolution election will clear out the worthless sort of independents in the Senate who get there because, you know, they've got extended families in Tasmania. So, you know, this is a very important we need to either stop this bill or we need to make it the center point of the next election because it is a very dangerous speech inhibiting bill. And uh, I want to hear Mr. Dutton come out and say that and do something about it. How could the ACMA define what it classifies as being reasonably likely to cause or contribute to harm? Well, they can't define it. They haven't in the bill. They don't even define really what serious harm is. So, I mean, we're all supposed to just intuit this and they can't really define it because nobody really knows what it is. You know, it turns out what is serious harm is closing schools for a year. It turns out what is serious harm is people not going to their, their cancer checkup for a year. It, it turns out a lot of the things that, oh, another thing about this bill is it exempts government. So anything government says is exempted from being categorized as mis or disinformation and not just government, the universities, and not just universities, the legacy press. So it's a imagine all the people on the yes side of the voice debate, they're exempted. The sort of establishment class is exempted. And the poor schlebs, you know, the, 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 the Hillary Clinton deplorables, your speech will be censored and controlled and overseen. You know, that's how bad it is. So it's not even everyone's open to being uh, investigated for misinformation, which is bad enough. The government is exempting itself and it's exempting you know the abc and the legacy press you can't imagine a more um aristocratic top-down uh approach to this it's, it's really shocking and I, i'd like to see the libs start coming out and blasting it one of the reasons they're a little bit uh, reticent is because the moronic idea was theirs during covid and i think dutton just needs to draw a line on this and say that was the morrison government I personally think a disgrace of a government and Morrison was a terrible prime minister because he had no values and didn't believe in anything as far as I could tell, but that's in the past. We are, we've, you know, we've learned our lesson. That would be a nice thing to say. And we are going to oppose this bill uh, right down to the last iota of our beings. And we're not going to let Paul Fletcher anywhere near the uh, portfolio. So at some point, we've got to push for that. We need to write to our MPs because the remedy for this is purely political. There's no other remedy. Yeah, so you've pointed out the many occasions during the COVID era, Jim, when there was misinformation from government. And, and isn't that something that governments have been doing for a very long time? I mean, we had the, you know, the last century with communism and Nazism and total control by government of media now, why would anybody think that governments wouldn't be the worst purveyors of self-serving and lying propaganda? Well, again, you know, whether they're the worst or not, I don't know. But uh, they were certainly, uh, if you buy Botticelli and he's a really good, he's, they were certainly the biggest source of uh, mis and disinformation. Uh, again, the, the in the terms of art, misinformation is when um, there are false claims and they're made unknowingly. And disinformation is when they're made knowingly. And, you know, if you look at the lockdown files that were published by the Telegraph, some of the things governments did, they knew they weren't true. That's disinformation. Government was dealing not just in misinformation, but disinformation. And so that is very problematic. Uh, and again, you know, sometimes, I mean, by and large, government, I think people who get elected, they're, they're, they're trying to do the best they can. And, you know, they got spooked by what happened in China during the and but once you get locked into a path, it's very hard to, you know, to hear the other side, it's very hard to admit you've made a mistake. And so you start off with good intentions, and then you go down a path, and it's very hard to turn around.
you know, Churchill was quite unusual. He always had somebody tell him, you know, he didn't, he always wanted to hear why he was wrong. And then he would probably go ahead and do what he was going to do anyway, but he wanted to hear it. You know, what do they call that now? The red team. I want a red team to come in and brief me. And Boris did that a little during the COVID, but then he just didn't pay attention. He, he sort of agreed with them, but he got overwhelmed, you know, because he was, he was a moral coward. Uh, so I'm skeptical of government, not so much because I think they deliberately are trying to do bad things. It's just that there's no reason to think that big giant bureaucracies are very good at getting the right thing. It's a, it's like a, an oil tanker turning it around. And so the best thing to do is to have as many voices as possible. Will some of them be, per, you know, purveying a flat earth view of the world? Yes, they will. You know, will some of them be advocating for homeopathy and some other ridiculous thing? Yes, they will. But, you know, you can trust your fellow citizens to sort it out by and large, the same way the Swedes did, who, again, have the lowest cumulative excess deaths and got almost <laughs> everything right in retrospect because the costs of lockdown were enormous. Leave aside just the deaths, the other deaths, the school lockdowns, the incredible hit to the economy, the massive transfer of wealth from young people to old people. Because, you know, when you spend money like a drunken sailor and you have massive money printing, what happens is you have asset inflation. It was the best two years ever to be a billionaire. We transferred money from the poor to the rich. Nobody calculated any of that. And the governments just got locked in. And so I, I agree with your premise that uh, there's no reason to want to live in a society where government is deemed to be the arbiter of truth. And it doesn't help that they dress this up with the fig leaf of handing it over to some appointed body like ACMA, who then dresses it up further by handing it over to a bunch of, and based on the evidence, this is a fair characterization, of left-wing fact checkers, almost always erring on the side of whatever the uh, conventional left-wing views are. So it's a disaster. So I, I came across a quote from the Human Rights Commissioner uh, recently, where, where she said, if, if we fail to ensure robust safeguards for freedom of expression online, the measures taken to combat misinformation and disinformation could themselves risk undermining Australia's democracy and freedom. Is she correct? Well, that's Lorraine Finley. So she's uh, actually my doctoral student. She is, you know, she, she is correct. I mean, the problem is the rest of the Human Rights Commission is pretty feeble on this. And even uh, I mean, not a one of them said anything through the two and a half years of the COVID. They couldn't find a single rights infringement while the Victorian police were handcuffing pregnant women and kicking protesters in the head and, you know, doing shocking things. They couldn't find a single rights infringement. They were totally quiet. But uh, now, you know, now that uh, that's over and they're back in the game of finding uh, some some some. Uh, someone claiming refugee status, they can find, uh, they're back to finding rights infringements. So Lorraine's had a tough go on the right, Human Rights Commission, uh, but she's right there. She had a tough go because the libs generally appoint useless people. You've seen it to the ABC, you've seen it to the courts. Uh, the entire Human Rights Commission, I think, are Morrison government appointees. And boy, you couldn't, I, I, you'd pro we'd probably be better off, leave aside Lorraine, we'd probably be better off if Labour had appointed them. That's how yeah, I don't know what it is about liberal governments, but they can't appoint a conservative to anything, no matter whatever. That's that's their basic uh, modus operandi. We have to appoint somebody that the left would like. <laughs> but uh, yeah, no, she's right about that. I think um, it would be nice to hear some of the other uh, human rights. Com I, I mean, I personally would close down the Human Rights Commission. I think it doesn't do any. It really doesn't achieve any good deeds, and it's cover for some pretty bad ones. I mean, the whole lawyerly cast would go crazy, but, you know, we've seen that we've seen the lawyers organizations we've seen. They played their hand in the voice referendum, and uh, it's pretty obvious where they sit on the uh, as, as a generalization on the political spectrum. Right. Good. So what I'll do at this point, Jim, is ask our my colleague, Peter Downey. Peter, do you have any questions from our viewers today that you'd like to put to Jim? I do have a couple of questions, Andrew. So uh, one from Adrian, well, there's two. I'll ask the first one first. What do you think of the multitude of anti-discrimination and discrimination commissions Australia has and the non-defendable right to be offended, Jim? 
Uh, yeah, I'm not a huge fan of these anti-discrimination ones. You could you could make it better by limiting the grounds of discrimination. You know, we could just stick to some basic ones like a religious viewpoint and color of your skin um, type of reproductive organs and leave it at that. Uh, definitely don't like the idea that someone's sense of being offended somehow triggers any legal outcomes at all. I mean, I... <laughs> I went when I went to school, a little state school in Canada. I went through all state schools in Toronto, is a low, lower middle class area of Toronto. Uh, you know, Calvinist, Scots Canadian sort of upbringing. Um, you know, what bullying meant when you went to school was, as a boy, you you got beaten up, and if someone called you names, my dad would just say, "Well, sticks and stones can hurt." It was not, a, no one cared if you were, in fact, it was a good day if you only got called names. Um, so the idea now that we want to turn out a generation that's so lacking in resilience and so, you know, they, they just crumble at the mere thought. Words are not violence. Words can be unpleasant. They can be a harm, but they're not violence. And barring the counseling of violence and some other forms of words, to a large extent, people just have to, you know, become resilient. And the way you respond to wrong ideas and the way you respond to nasty ideas is you re you reply and say why they're wrong and why they're nasty. And you don't bring the machinery of the state to bear because you know, someone's a bit offended. And that's that's a terrible development. And it also, you know, throws us, it makes us vulnerable to what's known as the heckler's veto. Is it the heckler's veto? I forget. It's the idea that the most sensitive person in the room sets the standards. You know, so people who aren't offended and they have a bit of resilience and a bit of a backbone and they go, well, I don't really care what, you know, he thinks of me because, well, they don't trigger anything. But the person who collapses in a or, you know, an orgy of feeling sorry for themselves, that that sets the standard. So offense should never be the standard. It doesn't matter if you're offended. And if the libs had done their job under Tony Abbott, they would have tried to repeal Section 18C. And I know the entire you know, he couldn't get it through the party room, but that's because we had all these Christopher Pine, Simon Birmingham types, Julian Leeser, who were blocking it. He should have taken it to the Senate and made the Senate block it. I mean, I still think we need to repeal Section 18C of the hate speech laws. Who cares if you're offended? It's a simple answer. I don't know what the answer to that is. Is, is that the test of the world? It's a real problem. And, uh, and a little bit of backbone goes a long way. You see that when you win a referendum and finally Mr. Chris Afuli here in uh, Queensland says we're not having a treaty, he does what's known as oppose. That's what oppositions are supposed to do. They're supposed to oppose things. They're not supposed to agree. Um, when he opposed it, the Palaszczuk government immediately pulled it. So let's start opposing these speech limiting proposals and, and bills. Hmm. Yeah, the good advice, uh, Jim. Now, the second part of his question, it says, uh, what is your view on the UN's efforts to move the UDIR into identity politics, sexuality and Indigenous rights? Yeah, I don't really have, uh, you know, these, these UN organisations are very problematic. I don't know how many of your readers know, but there have been more resolutions by the General Council and the uh, UN Human Rights uh, Council uh, more against Israel than every other country on earth combined. So, you know, the worst place, on, according to the UN, the worst place in the world to be a woman is Israel. And it, it's worse than every other country on earth combined. You know, it It is a political organization. It's probably good to have a body where the Americans can talk to the Chinese and they have a veto. But in terms of having some second rate uh, UN officials come and tell you that Australia, you're you know, your rights infringing, well, there, there's no accountability for those views. It's They're highly undemocratic. There's, the, you know, this sort of idea that these supranational bodies have more insight and more legitimacy than your national democratically elected government is, to my mind, incredibly wrong. And part of the problem is also these unelected judges who, you know, the last 25 years around the Anglosphere and probably around the democratic world can be summed up as a massive increase in judicial power. The judges have increased their own power by means of how they go about interpreting text. They, they treat constitutions as living documents, which, what, you know, what does that mean? 
It means that the judges update them at the point of application. And the updating always tends to give the judges more say in the future and always tends to deliver outcomes that are more congenial to the lawyerly cast. Uh, you know, I, I don't really buy a lot of the interpretive approaches. So they've, they've, they've uh, shorn away. And so there's the judges are the problem. UN agencies are the problem. I think the EU is a pretty uh, basically fundamentally undemocratic body. It is a club for democracies, true, but the EU is a fundamentally undemocratic body. And the main reason I would have voted for Brexit was because of that. And it limits what your elected representatives can do for you. And there's no recourse. So it's an aristocratic sort of House of Lords type arrangement and the UN is even worse. And now it's true that UN sort of decision making bodies are not part of the domestic law of Australia. But in administrative law and other areas, the judges pay attention to that sometimes when there's ambiguity, sometimes not. And they use it as an interpretive method. I mean, I'm skeptical about international law on the whole. I'm skeptical about how treaties are treated and even more so about um, you know, non-treaty based international law. Now, you you know, you you uh, there are remedies, but we don't really we're, we're not an, an important enough country to to sort of meet out the remedies. The Americans pay what, 30 to 35 percent of the U.N. budget. So, you know, Reagan cut the just stop paying for a while. Um, Trump never did that, but he might if he wins another term. Um, and so, you know, maybe maybe the Americans need to go some the Americans pay the vast uh, not the vast preponderance, but they pay the by far the biggest chunk of the UN budget. And as far as I can tell, they don't get any votes going their way. The recent vote about Israel was shocking. And uh, and I think Australia abstained on that, which is embarrassing. Hmm. They're all very true, Jim. Uh, I've got a question from Sean. Uh, how can we stop this misinformation law from becoming legislation? Well, we might not be able to stop it. We elected a government, and if they can get it through the Senate, I mean, we I think they're vulnerable right now after the voice. We need a we need a right of center coalition opposition that is opposing it, that is saying that it's an exercise in authoritarian overreach, and that they will repeal it on day one of a new government. And they have to make it a focal point. And that you shouldn't let if you you know if you have a MP who is a coalition uh, person, you have to write to them and say, I won't be supporting you unless. I hear some pretty strong opposition to this ACMA bill and, uh, you know, a firm, strong stance and labor might fold because I think when people get the details, it'll be pretty unpopular. But, you know, it's like everything in life. The remedy is political. Nothing wrong with that. Hmm. Yeah. Um, and another question. Uh, do you have any thoughts on the EU targeting Elon Musk? over supposed misinformation on Twitter. Given his huge public profile, could this be the start of a strong pushback against elites attempting to control narratives with misinformation laws? Yeah, well, um, it's coming up to about, I think it's just, we just passed the year from when uh, Musk bought Twitter, turned it into X. It's just a year, it's a year and a little bit, but we just passed the one year anniversary and I give him about a B plus. He's done a, he, he's made it a much better um, platform for views. It's not perfect, but you know, I don't think I don't think that if we had COVID today, the governments would be able to sort of effectively silence and uh, deplatform anywhere near the way they did when um, Twitter was in the hands of the pre-Musk people. Uh, when it comes to people with what does he have three or four hundred billion dollars? I don't think you never need to worry about. They they can look after themselves. Uh, he can sorry, he can have a fight with the EU. I, I'm not a big fan of the EU. I think it's in the game of overreach. As a you know, a chunk of the world, they've got the slowest growing economy in in the world. That because it's so centralized, and uh, I mean, at the end of the day, Musk could just take uh, he could take Twitter X out of the EU. See how the various governments respond to that. So I I you know, we don't need to be in the game of giving uh, advice to a billionaire. He's pretty smart guy he can look after himself uh i have same sort of view about trump you know trump can look after himself even though they're bringing to bear the entire sort of legal machinery 
in a disgracefully third world way, he's still well enough off and rich enough. He can sort of look after himself. It's everyone below these people who, you know, the real problem is who's being silenced, who can't look after themselves, which is almost everybody else. And so I think that is a problem. Hmm. Here, here. Um, the last question I've got is, uh, how will this misinformation bill, if implemented, uh, limit Christians uh, being able to engage with other religions in debate. Yeah, well, we don't know. It'll be a. It's all. It's all. Up, we don't know what serious harm is. We don't have. It's not really defined. It'll be. You know. The, I. My guess is, is early on they're not going to want to cause any too many waves. <laughs> so who knows? But the problem is that they won't be doing it. They will effectively force a code of conduct or an ind industry standard on the social media companies, and they'll do the limiting. And you can bet that if someone takes a vigorous view on the transgender issue, say from a Christian perspective, they're not going to like that because we already know that that's what's limited. Right. So, you know, we're in a world today where if you say uh, someone with uh, a Y chromosome shouldn't be playing women's sports, that's that's taken to be uh, an unusual view for 99.999% of human history. It was a self-evidently obvious view. I mean, I played competitive university sports in North America. I was the shortest guy on a basketball, a varsity basketball team. We used to play the Canadian women's national team in the summer. We'd practice. We, you know, we 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 just used to take it easy on them. I mean, because we would have crushed them if we wanted to. I mean, it was just, you know, sort of still gentlemanly back there. But if you don't think that, I, you know, that, there was a Dallas all-star high school team that played the women's national U.S. soccer team. So this is when they were winning the World Cup. These were the best women soccer players in the world. And they went and had a practice game against the Dallas team of under 15-year-old boys. And the boys beat them five to two. If they played, if they play, you know, if the U.S. women's soccer team played the U.S. men's soccer team, the men would score as many goals as they want. I've heard experts in soccer. I, you know, I, I grew up in Canada in the 60s and 70s. So if a boy played soccer, you might as well have played, you might as well have, you know, taken up ballet. That was the general view about soccer. It's, it's changed. But, you know, I've heard people say that the, the U.S. men's soccer team would win 30 to not, they could score as many goals as they want. It's because biologically men are bigger, faster, stronger, statistically speaking. You know, everything's a distribution and at the far end of the distribution for women, you're overlapping the back end of the distribution for men. But biologically, it's just not fair. And having some guy who's coming 700th in NCAA swimming, and then the next day he decides he's going to be a woman, and he starts winning races, well, that's because he had a lifetime. Uh, uh, you know, he had a teenage years of just having testosterone course through his body, and he's got faster muscle twitch, and it's just not fair. And why should girls have to compete against what are effectively boys? Because they're never going to win. <laughs> And if you can't see that that's a problem when it comes to sports, then obviously one remedy is for those kind of people to try to censor people pointing this out. And I really sort of admire people like Riley Gaines in the U.S., the swimmer. She, you know, she was going to be a dentist, but she's she's sort of made the next two or three years her crusade to sort of fight for women's sports. But, you know, who are the allies on this? You've got Martina Navratilova and J.K. Rowling. These are not right of center women. They're just saying, you know, there's something terribly wrong. The ideology is so pernicious that you've got lots of instances of people like the Scottish left-wing SNP government putting male rapists into female prisons because they put their hands up and say, uh, you know, I, I, I'm identifying as a woman. I don't blame anybody in a top security prison from wanting to go into the women's prison. I We used to, at the end of our basketball season in Kingston, where I, I went to Queen's University, had all the main prisons in Canada. And as a public service sort of thing, every year at the end of the season, we would go and play a game, an exhibition game in the maximum security prison of Canada. Murderers, rapists, armed robbers. It was the scariest two hours of your life. We didn't have a shower afterwards, let me tell you. And, uh, you know, the coach said, don't get too far ahead and don't annoy anybody. And the warden said, oh, it'll be OK, because it's, you know, it gives them something to do. At one point, I remember the basketball bounced into the weight room and even the other prisoners wouldn't go in there. Well, anyone who's been into a maximum security prison knows it's a hell on earth. And so 
from the point of view of a rapist, of course you'd want to get out of the male's prison. But why would a thinking human being allow someone like that to go to the women's prison? I mean, there's examples of these guys then going into the women's prison and raping women. <laughs> of course, this is how pernicious this ide ideology is, where you're not even allowed to point out factual truths about the world. Such is the power of this sort of uh, bizarre ideology, this sort of commitment to you know, identity politics, really, and this sort of oppression Olympics. And nobody really knows the hierarchy of your victimhood. It sort of forms uh, fluidly, and no one really controls it. But you know, wherever you are on the victim hierarchy seems to determine outcomes. And so the sort of what used to be the left-wing feminists, are, they lose to the transgender lobby. I don't know why. Nobody really can say why this is. But, uh, you know, you read J.K. Rowling, she's just right. In terms of facts about the world, she's right. And we live in, you know, there are facts that are imposed on us by the external <laughs> causal world. And if those facts tend to make you feel a bit uh, sad or you wish you had been born a different sex, it doesn't make it true. It just means that you're sad. And there's no reason why someone's sense of self-identification should trump facts about the world. Now, personally, I don't care how what other people wear. And I don't really care how they live, lead their lives. But if they start asking me that I have to accept their views so that women have to compete against men, well, I draw the line there. And I'm, I draw the line at pronouns, too. I'm not going to be told what pronouns to use because pronouns are an indication of something that's true about the external cause of the world. So as long as the, I'm not being asked to lie, in effect, I don't care how other people live their lives. But the idea that I have to approve of their decisions, well, that's different. You know, one of the odd things is that the idea of tolerance came out of the West, and it came out of the sort of exceedingly brutal religious wars between Protestants and Catholics. A lot of deaths, and it became obvious that this is just a mug scheme. So the idea of tolerance is, well, we'll, we'll adopt a live and let live attitude. So if your little principality wants to be Protestant, that's fine. We'll be Catholic or vice versa. And so tolerance really meant live and let live. It didn't mean I have to agree with you because, you know, the Protestants and the Catholics took fundamentally different views about um, who was right on cr crucial issues. But it was a very intelligent way to deal with difference. You just let other people live their lives. You, you weren't expected to respect their choices. And what has happened is the whole idea of tolerance in the last 15, 20 years has sort of transmogrified or sort of mutated into this idea. I mean, the live and let live attitude is very healthy in a democracy. But the idea that I have to revel in and accept, and not just that, I have to sort of almost celebrate the choices you make that's crazy. And we have to fly flags and we all have to agree with your choices. So it's not, tolerance is now not just live and let live. It's a sort of, you have to show some sort of public uh, approval of my choices. You have to respect my choice. But why should you have to do that? There's all sorts of people in the world who make choices I don't respect. I think they're making bad choices. They're drinking too much. They're gambling too much. I think they're making bad choices, right? I don't care what their choices are in a way. And so now tolerance has become a sort of intolerance because if you don't respect my choices, you're not, well, that's, you know, tolerance is just, I'm happy to be polite to people and I'm happy to leave them to make any choices they want in their life. But that doesn't mean that I respect their choices. A lot of people make choices I don't respect. And I'm sure, you know, I know for a fact that a lot of people in universities don't respect my choices and they think that I'm, you know, crazy. Well, that's fine. We all get together for tea and we're all very polite. That's the old fashioned tolerance that sort of grew out of the um, sort of religious wars and were, was a really was a force for good for 200 plus years, 250. Now people expect by tolerance that you have to sort of genuflect at the altar of the choices they've made. Well, you know, I don't largely to a lot for a lot of them. And that's that's a that that mutated version of tolerance is not a very attractive one. Oh, thank you very much, uh, Jim. That all makes a lot of sense to me. I hope it does to our audience. Back over to you, Andrew. Thank you, Peter, and thank you, Jim. It's always a pleasure to, to have you on and, and hear your forthright opinions, which I must say I concur with as well. 
All the best to you this afternoon. Thank you. Well, well thanks, guys. It sounds like I'm being interviewed by my mom. So there, you can't really do worse than that. Uh, you know the. <laughs> You know the guy who got this incredibly fulsome uh, introduction and he gets up to the lectern and he says, uh, you know, my dad would have really loved to have heard that uh, introduction and my mom, well, she would have believed it. So uh, <laughs> thanks, guys. That's uh, that's great. Oh, I'll sign off. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. <laughs>